essays. Well, it was originally just going to be an audio collection. So I chose things that I'd always looked forward to reading out loud. It was that simple. That's simple. Okay. Well, let's talk a little bit about the story. So one of the essays, The Motherless Bear, generated the most anger from readers the first time around. Can you tell us a little <laughs> bit about that? Well, a number of years ago, I started writing, I guess you could call them fables. And I was substituting animals for humans. And I wrote one about a bear whose mother dies and who just goes around trying to elicit sympathy from people, talking about how her mother died, just so she can take extra food and she can, you know, so she can harvest pity. And this bear winds up like in a wretched kind of small circus where it kind of wears a skirt and dances around and has all of its teeth pulled. And people are just <laughs> furious. And I've never gotten so much hate mail. And the thing is that it was a fictional story. And a woman in England wrote and chided me. She said, how dare you mock these intelligent and sentient creatures? Oh. <laughs> she demanded that I donate money to a bear rescue. And you're like, fiction, okay. <laughs> <laughs> One thing you did not include, though, is the Santa Land Diaries, the essay about your time as a Christmas elf that introduced you to many NPR listeners. Yeah. Well, you know, I think you're lucky if you have something that resonates with people. But I got to say that thing, it never did a thing for me. Mm. You know, the writing in the Sandland Diaries is really clunky to me. Mm. I can't bear it. It's interesting what people love versus what you love. Well, I often feel like saying to people like, gosh, can't you see how that thing I had in the New Yorker a couple months ago is like a hundred times better? <laughs> And again, I'm grateful that I wrote something that people enjoyed, but because it was my choice what went into this book, I was so happy to exclude it. Yeah. yeah. I actually excluded it, and I wanted its feelings to be hurt. Mm, mm -hmm. <laughs> and we're talking about it, yes. Well, many of these essays are about your family, of course, but in your introduction, you take issue with the phrase, that friends are the family you choose. Well, you hear that all the time now, and I, I feel for people who aren't accepted by their family or who just simply dislike their family. And I think it's great that they found a group of friends that they can share everything emotionally with, and that's fantastic. I just wouldn't call it a family. To me, the thing about a family is that you can't choose it. It's a hand that you're dealt, and you've got to play that hand. I really lucked out in that department. I mean, I'm crazy about my family. You also take issue with people who read your essays and call your family dysfunctional. I just feel that's a lazy word. And I can't tell you how many times I've been signing books and someone will say, oh, I love your dysfunctional family. And I'm really grateful that they bought a book and I'm <laughs> grateful that they want it signed. But the second I hear that, my back goes up and I, I say, what's dysfunctional about them? When you really think about dysfunction in a family, I mean, you're thinking, me anyway, I'm thinking incest, abuse, I'm thinking torture. I'm not thinking hiding bananas under the sink in your bathroom. That's just gently crazy at best. Yeah, which your father did, which you wrote in the book that he actually did. Um, you have some really humorous stories about your family in this collection. For example, the f perfect fit about you and your sisters, Amy and Gretchen, shopping in Tokyo. What's it like to shop with your sisters? Well, the problem is that, I mean, I went shopping with my sister Amy yesterday and tried on a blouse, okay? I mean, it wasn't, <laughs> it was just clearly... A blouse and I'd suggested it for her and she said I don't know you know it's roomy why don't you try it on try it on no one will know and you know the buttons are on the wrong side and it kind of came to my belt in the front and had a you know Peter Pan collar <laughs> it was, was it cute on you that's the point though uh, I did consider it but yeah. the point is that she can talk me into anything <laughs> and then I try to do the same to her Clerks are delighted when they see us walk into a store together. They know they're going to get a sale. Yeah, it's pretty guaranteed. 
I mean, I have siblings who don't care to shop. And I have to say, I, I mean, I love them and I love spending time with them, but it's just easier to spend time with the shopping ones. Because I quit taking drugs, gosh, I guess it was like 20 years ago. I worried about that because my family, we've always taken drugs together and it was just a beautiful way to spend time. I don't mean we weren't shooting up heroin. It was like LSD. and I mean, they'd be followed by everyday drugs, but, the, you know, the main course <laughs> but this, yeah, these events, was a psychedelic. Yeah. Um, and when I quit taking drugs, I worried that I would, that I'd lost a very important way of connecting with my family. Mm. And because we fundamentally like each other, it works out fine. But, you know, it's easier in stores. There are more serious topics in, in your book as well. Your mother's drinking, your sister Tiffany's suicide. What does writing these essays do for you in processing what I would say are traumas, but I don't know if you see it that way? Well, it's never writing's never been cathartic for me. It doesn't fix anything. It doesn't necessarily make me feel better, but it helps me make sense of my world and sometimes something happens and I think gosh I'm gonna need a long time to figure this out or to find a way find a way to make it funny really mm -hmm. I mean what is that comedy is tragedy plus time mm -hmm. and I don't care to write something that's not funny you know that's not gonna get some laughs like in the essay about my sister's suicide my family went to the grocery store. We were on the coast of North Carolina. And we were in the produce department, and my brother took a bundle of parsley. And it was one of those stores where they moisturize, you know, the fruits and vegetables, so they're always damp. And he snuck up behind me, and he said, Achoo! While he whipped the parsley through the air. So I just felt this spray mm -hmm. on the back of my arms and the back of my neck, and I thought that a stranger had sneezed on me. Mm -hmm. It was just such a good laugh in the story, mm -hmm. you know, and it wasn't disrespectful to include it. I mean, it, to me, I was just kind of showing how, you know, we still have to go on. But it's, that's an especially good trick to play on people now yeah. with COVID, the parsley yeah. trick. People might start fighting, though. That's kind of serious right there. <laughs> it's funny, <laughs> but not during COVID <laughs> times. That's some. <laughs> no, you would do it to someone you know. Yeah, you know, I wouldn't recommend it to a stranger. <laughs> no, no, no. Before we started, you actually told us that you'd already walked 14,000 steps in your little tracker. Mm -hmm. You've been walking a lot lately during this pandemic. Any new discoveries as you walk through New York City? It's interesting to be in the city without tourists. Mm -hmm. Because normally, there'd be certain parts of town you would just avoid just because they would be clotted with people walking five abreast and taking pictures of everything. And those people aren't here. So that was interesting. Also, normally I felt like one out of every 500 people you passed on the street was crazy. And then it became one out of every two. Mm -hmm. And so I usually go out after midnight, in part because there's nobody out, except one night I was walking through Times Square and a man said, look at the clown. And I looked at what I was wearing and I thought, okay, it's a little bit strange. But then I followed his gaze and there was an actual clown. <laughs> there was an actual clown with like purple hair and a clown suit on. And it was like two o'clock in the morning. Oh, man, I mean, when do you sleep? I go to bed at around three. Oh, okay. And then, um, you know, get up at around 10. Partly it's because I, I want to wake up with four or five miles under my belt. Because you don't know what might happen, mm. right? What if I woke up and somebody said, you've got to get on this plane to Australia? I had a perfect record, right? I have a Fitbit and an Apple Watch. And I had a perfect record on my Apple Watch for like, I don't know, two years. And then, meaning I filled in all my circles... And then I had to fly from uh, Los Angeles to Australia, and I crossed the international date line, and I lost a day. Oh, my gosh. And I had to start all over from scratch. Yeah, you don't want to deal so with that So I live again. in fear of, of something like that happening. My record is 91,000 steps. That's 43 miles. In a day? In a day. 
24 hours. I started at midnight, and then I was with a friend, and then we came home at 6 in the morning, and we rested for a bit, and then went out again, and came home for lunch, and then went out again, and came home for dinner, and then went out again. And she and I can talk about that any time, day or night. <laughs> you can we live every so moment. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> 91,000 steps. <laughs> well, you know, of all the things of this lovely conversation, I am really inspired to charge up my Fitbit and get back out there again. Thank you, David. Oh, thank you. I appreciate it. And to read an excerpt of David Sedaris's The Best of Me, go to hereandnow.org. It is 1231 right now, and this is 91.3 FM KBIA. Well, you can make a lasting difference to the station that is...